Hi, I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about Gwendolyn Brooks, who is the first African American uh, to receive the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry, and of course she was the first African American woman to receive the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. She was born in 1917 and died in 2000, um, and there were two main periods for her poetry. One was prior to 1967 when she was just considered herself a poet. Um, really didn't take on the calls of, of African American literature at all. But it would be after 1967 that she would become more aligned with uh, the more militant black writers who uh, believed in exploring and um, protesting inequality and exploring the, the African Americans' role in um, the emerging modern culture. Um, she was um, especially interested in African American women and the roles that that they played, the very complex lives. She was uh, born in Kansas, but spent most of her life in Chicago. She was part of the uh, the Renaissance uh, there, the aftermath of the Renaissance there, and um, she was heavily influenced by um, modern poets like Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot, and uh, really focused a great deal on waste and loss, and um, kind of, especially in the, the latter part of her career, really focused on what Langston Hughes had referred to as a dream deferred. Um, there is a particular passage from her, her bio on page 1300 um, that you can look at. She wrote about the ordinary aspects of black life. She portrayed the good girls who want to be bad, the bored children of hardworking, pious mothers, the laments of women, some of them mothers, abandoned by their men. Her diction was a combination, and this is important, the street talk, the florid biblical speech of black Protestant preachers, and the traditional vocabulary of English and American uh, verse. And one thing that was really odd about her is that uh, more than any other modern poet, she used the, the sonnet, um, which is a very constrained, restrained um, type of writing, very specific um, in the formatting, and, and she used more than any other modern writer this, the form of the sonnet, so she knew the traditional poetry uh, format. Um, she became uh, associated in New York City with um, black feminism, and she left her, her publishers that she had been with for years and had her work printed by African-American publishers, um, her, her subjects became increasingly political and her, her format became less and less traditional and more and more uh, kind of improvisational jazz, uh, which took on kind of the Harlem Renaissance um, ideal of improvisational jazz. It never sounds quite the same. It's not, uh, it's not heavily formatted and that sort of thing. And that's um, what she pretty much came to be known for at the end of her um, career. Um, uh, Rita Dove, a modern poet, wrote, how does one convey the influence Gwendolyn Brooks has had on generation, not only writers, but people from all walks of life? Um, she remarked how she, as a young woman, was struck by these poems that weren't afraid to take language and swamp it, twist it, and engage it so that it shimmered and dashed and lingered. And the first little poem that I want to um, to talk to you about, uh, uh, Brooks, is, is on 1301, and it's called Kitchenette Building. And if you'll notice, um, it's from her very popular uh, collection prior to 1967 poems from a street in Bronzeville. Um, the Kitchenette Building is, is a poem about dreams. And the we that she uses as the, the first person speaker here refers to, of course, um, primarily African-American, uh, poor, working class African-Americans. And she says, we are things of dry hours and the involuntary plan, grayed in and gray. 
Dream makes a giddy sound, not strong like rent, feeding a wife, satisfying a man. But could a dream send up through onion fumes its white and violet? Fight with fried potatoes and yesterday's garbage ripening in the hall? Flutter or sing an aria down these rooms? Even if we were willing to let it in, had time to warm it, keep it very clean, anticipate a message, let it begin. We wonder, but not well, not for a minute. Since number five is out of the bathroom now, we think of lukewarm water and hope to get in it. Here's the, the contrast, the very stark contrast between rea the reality of their lives and dreams. Dreams are giddy. Green, dreams have no substance for these people. They don't have time to dream. Dreams can't live in this place that has onion fumes and has rent to be paid and ripening garbage and we're waiting on hot water. Um, dreams and uh, romantic ideals have no place in this world. There is no time. Uh, very... Um, accessible. Uh, one of the things I like best about Gwendolyn Brooks is the accessibility of her, her imagery. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot to you about the mother because there is a discussion about that that I want you to kind of look through it, but the mother is one of the starkest of uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, probably my favorite, uh, beginning on 1301 and going over to 1302. Um, these are, this is a beautiful poem. Uh, I will read it aloud. I'm not going to do a lot of explanation. You won't need it. Uh, but I want you to think through this poem, uh, a little for yourself. The mother, notice again that it is not capitalized. Abortions will not let you forget. You remember the children you got that you did not get. The damp, small pulps with a little or with no hair the singers and workers that never handled the air. You will never neglect or beat them or silence or buy with a sweet. You will never wind up the sucking thumb or scuttle off ghosts that come. You will never leave them controlling your luscious sigh, return for a snack of them with gobbling mother eye. I have heard in the voices of the wind, the voices of my dim killed children, I have contracted, I have eased my dim deers at the breast they could never suck. I have said, sweets, if I sinned, if I seized your luck and your lives from your unfinished reach, if I stole your births and your names, your straight body tears and your games, your stilted or lovely loves, your tumults, your marriages, aches and your deaths, if I poisoned the beginnings of your breaths, Believe that even in my deliberateness, I was not deliberate. Though why should I whine? Whine that the crime was other than mine? Since anyhow, you were dead, or rather, or instead, you were never made. But that too, I am afraid, is faulty. Oh, what shall I say? How is the truth to be said? You were born, you had body, you died. It is just that you never giggled or planned or cried. Believe me, I loved you all. Believe me, I knew you, though faintly, and I loved, I loved you all. The last two um, small poems, one is very, very much kind of street talk, improvisational, um, and it describes an entire generation for Gwendolyn Brooks, especially of young African-American men who could not find a place in this world. And you have very similar, some very similar images and ideals uh, with today. It's called We Real Cool, and it's on 1903. The pool players, seven at the golden shovel. We real cool. We left school. We lurk late. We strike straight. We sing sin. We thin gin. We jazz June. We die soon. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, again, you hear the rhythm of Gwendolyn Brooks' language, and you hear very, you see very stark um, 
descriptions of the young African-American men, and this was 1960. Uh, prior to the major push, um, of course, after, after some uh, civil rights movement, but just prior to the major push of the civil rights era. And the last uh, poem that is a small little poem, but it's very, very important. It's called The Last Quatrain of the Ballad of Emmett Till. And the last quatrain, of course, being the last verse. And the ballad is the story song of Emmett Till. And if you don't know, you can look at your footnotes, but the uh, Emmett Till was the 14-year-old African-American uh, young man who came to Mississippi from Chicago in night and was basically lynched in 1955 for leering at a white woman in Money, Mississippi, and there is a a monument there uh, to Emmett Till today. It was later um, pretty much settled that the woman who had accused him um, accused him falsely, uh, but he was um, he was lynched in Money, Mississippi in 1955. Uh, listen to this quote ballad. After the murder, after the burial, Emmett's mother is a pretty-faced thing, the tent of pull taffy. She sits in a red room drinking black coffee. She kisses her killed boy, and she is sorry. Chaos and windy grays through a red prairie. The murder and the burial of her son, Emmett Till, and you can kind of draw whatever conclusions you want to draw, but she's a pretty faced thing, the tent of pulled taffy. If you know anything about taffy, you know that it, once it's pulled, it's a light tan color. Um, and it says that Emmett Till's mother is the color of pulled taffy. She sits in a red room, perhaps uh, associated with violence, Drinking black coffee. Why? To stay awake? To stay alert? She kisses her killed boy, and she is sorry. And what I have to ask is, what do you think she's sorry for? She didn't kill her son. She sends him to Mississippi. Perhaps um, some people have suggested that maybe she's sorry for sending him to Mississippi without his being properly prepared for what he would face here um, without maybe her telling him the, the reality of life in Mississippi, especially rural Mississippi in 1955. I don't know. It just says she kisses her killed boy and she is sorry. And you have to make up your mind pretty much interpret what, that as you will. What is she sorry for? Chaos in windy grays. And of course, which city is called the Windy City, of course, Chicago, and it, it is set in a prairie um, in the Windy City of Chicago, in the prairie. She kisses her boy, and she's sorry, and sorry for what? And that is Gwendolyn Brooks, and what you'll be tested on.